So in this segment, we're going to be talking about growing out Caternix chicks and the different types of setups, some of the equipment or gear that you'll need um, to do so. Uh, first off, um, what are grow outs? Um, well, let me back a minute. Um, last week's live, we talked about incubating and hatching out uh, Caternix quail and getting them into the brooder and some of the equipment and gear that you'll need for that. And uh, so now we're just going to keep moving, moving on uh, as the chicks grow up. So once your uh, chicks reach a certain age, they start to feather out and no longer need the heat um, or the heat source. Uh, and it also helps to move them out of the brooder into a larger cage. Uh, this is actually when I do my first sorting, uh, when they come out of the brooder, you know, I'll sort chicks by color, uh, size, what, whatnot, but we'll go into that in a minute. Um, but you can see that these birds here are roughly, you know, two and a half to three weeks old. And for the most part, um, they have all their feathers with exception of uh, their head feathers. Um, these birds here uh, at this age uh, no longer require heat. Uh, it's pretty warm down in uh, Florida here, so I can get my birds off of the heat a little bit sooner uh, than most people. Um, but yeah, around, around two and a half to three weeks old, um, I take my birds off the heat and put them into grow-out pens. And there are several different styles of grow-out pens. Uh, you could purchase, you know, commercial models. Uh, like this one here, that, that unit on the top is actually a, uh, a brooder grow out combo. Um, and the bottom one's a later case, so I don't even really know why I included that photo. But uh, in this photo, you can see that on the left hand side, I've got all my commercial cages. Uh, the first two are, uh, the first two units are layer cages, and the third unit is actually a, a grow out setup. And the only real difference between hatching times brooder and their grow out is uh, one they have the brooders have a solid plastic door on it um, to where the the grow outs have um, the yellow doors like you see here in the front uh, two units uh, but for the most part the the units the same thing it's solid all the way around um, solid top and uh, it is does have a graded floor in it and I'll show you that a little bit close up of that here in a second but the the cage that behind me uh that is a grow out pen that i built a couple years ago when i first started with quail here in shop there's actually a video on the channel that shows you how to build that unit um but this is inside the grow out uh slash or the brooder slash grow out pen of hatching times cage you can see these birds here uh well you can see the light so that that one's telling me that this is actually uh, a brooder and these birds are you know, pretty much fully feathered out with the exception of their heads. So they're ready to go into a brooder setup. This is the type of brooder that I currently use. Or I'm sorry, this is the type of grow out pen that I currently use. Uh, once my birds reach that, you know, two and a half to three week mark um, and they no longer require heat, I will place them in. This is basically just a, uh, you know, a wire cage with a flat floor on it. Um, you see on top, I do have, um, a uh, light on there for you know supplemental heat sometimes in the evening it gets a little bit chilly so when i first move them over uh, i like to transition them kind of slow uh, i'll let them go during the day with no heat and then at night i might turn the heat on just to uh hold on guys i gotta get a drink here i'll put the light on just to supply heat in the evening time you know when it cools down a little bit but for me Moving them from the brooder to the grow outs is all about transitioning. Uh, I transition them from one cage style. Um, and this cage too also has the uh, half inch by one inch flooring. And a lot of people are concerned that that's a little bit too big for their feet. But what I'll do sometimes is put um, the blue shop towels down in that cage for just a day or so. Just enough to, because when they're walking on the shop towels, they can still feel the, the wire below their feet. And that just helps them transition a little bit easier to that type of wire. Uh, this is uh, a larger uh, grow out pens that I used to have a couple years ago when I first got started. Uh, these things measure six foot by 24. 
<clears throat> and you can see that I've got, you know, the automatic watering system in it. Uh, this was back before I actually got into using J feeders. I use those, uh, the red trough style feeder or the shoebox feeder, and we'll show you that here in a minute. Um, but this cage was large enough, uh, being six by 24, I, on an average, I would put, you know, 45 to 50 uh, chicks in each one of these, and that would, you know, keep them growing or, or keep them going long enough until I could get them, you know, sorted out and put in their permanent cages. There's just another shot of that pen. Um, and like I say, these are the ones that I use now. Uh, these are so easily built, guys. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, wire, some J clips and pliers, and you could, you know, assemble these yourself. Um, so far for me, they've worked really well. I like them because they, they've got a lot of, you know, they're exposed all the way around. So there's always constant, you know, good air movement going through the cage, which seems to help, um, you know, with, you know, manure smell and whatnot. But uh, this is what it looks like in the rack systems. Um, the first one on the left hand side, those are my layer cages. Uh, you can see they got the egg rollouts on it. But if you look at the one behind me, um, that is a grow out setup. Uh, they've got the J feeders on it. The top unit you can see still has a, uh, a clamp lamp, but it's mounted on the, on the side of the cage instead of sitting on the top. And uh, that, you know, seems to be, you know, it does really well for me as far as getting my chicks, you know, out of the brooder and into grubs. But as far as assembling these things, like I said earlier, if you picked up a set of uh, the J-clip pliers, some J-clips and the wire, which is this shot here, um, you could go through and build all your own grouch. You could build all your own uh, layer cages and uh, save you quite a bit of money. Um, I actually prefer to use a DIY cage for a brooder uh, or for a grout um, just because the cost of, you know, commercially built units are, you know, up there quite a ways. <clears throat> okay, and this is a unit uh, that I built for outside. I know some people say, um, I want to move my birds out of the brooder outside. Um, how long before they can go outside? For me, being down here in Florida, I can get my birds completely off the heat by three weeks of age and outside. And you can see this cage is pretty much open all the way around with the exception of the top and the backs. Um, and again, that's for, you know, good air movement through the cage. Uh, I find that if you put enough chicks in a grow out pen, even if it does get a little bit chilly at night, the chicks can always huddle together and, and you know, keep themselves warm. I've never had a problem with them outside. Uh, these pens work really well. They're six foot wide, 20 inches deep. And for, for the most part, I put 40 to 45 chicks in uh, each one of these units. <clears throat> and again, here's the, the uh, DIY cage. Uh, this is actually a clip from the, from the video off the channel. Um, those are pretty simple to build. Um, you can put probably, uh, we're going to talk numbers a little bit later in this, but you could probably put uh, about 20 to 25, maybe even 30 uh, smaller chicks in here, ones that are fresh out of the brooder. Uh, they can put like, you know, 30 per unit. Uh, but once they start getting a little size on them, I like to cut them back to about uh, 20 birds uh, per unit on this cage setup. Okay, uh, another thing too, if you don't have, if you're not keeping your birds inside, you don't have the outside cages, you want to keep your birds in, you know, more of a natural setting, uh, aviary. There's a lot of times my birds will come out of the uh, brooder and go directly into the aviary. Uh, the main point being is make sure that they are fully feathered. Um, and uh before I put them in, in the aviary, I like to kind of wait till they're probably closer to three and a half or four weeks old. That way they've got, you know, pretty much all their feathering, the head feathers and everything. Um, but the one thing I really like about putting them in an aviary settings is if you look at all these birds here, these are all young birds, but there's absolutely uh, no plumage damage to them, you know, from, you know, overactive, uh, you know, males breeding or, uh, you know, fighting or whatnot. They've actually already gone through their postnatal molt. So these birds all look really good. And what I'll do is I'll actually go out and sit in the aviary and just kind of watch the birds. And that's how I sort them. I, I select the, the ones that I want to bring, bring inside for brooder or for breeders. 
and you know the rest will stay out here and I'll use it as a, uh, a grow out for a meat bin. But I like the aviary because one, you can, you know, give them a, like I said, a more natural looking setting. Uh, and it's just kind of enjoyable to, uh, you know, be able to go out there and, you know, sit with the birds. Uh, another nice thing about the aviary setup is um, the ease of keeping it clean. I recently went to the deep litter method where uh, I've got uh, compost, or not compost, but uh, mulch uh, built up around eight to 10 inches deep. And I can clean cages or clean the aviary about every two weeks. I'll just go out there, flip the uh, mulch over a little bit, and maybe every six to eight months, I'll completely pull it out because it's pretty much composted by then. I'll pull it out and that'll go in the garden and I'll put uh, fresh stuff in. All right, so let's talk a little bit about feeders. Now we're going to get into uh, some of the stuff uh, now that we went through all the different types of grow out pens that you can use. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about feeders and waterers and whatnot uh, and feed. Uh, first off, obviously, this is a your standard J feeder. Um, it's got, you know, you can fill it from outside of the draw cage. Uh, it's got a trough that uh, kind of goes inside the cage. You can see that there. Uh, they are pretty decent about um, reducing feed waste as long as you do the modification to them. Um, I got a video on the channel that shows you how to do that. Basically, it's just taking some uh, either one by one or one by two uh, welded wire and mounting it over top of the trough that just keeps the birds from kicking it out. Uh, that's one type of feeder I use. That is usually uh, what I will get them transitioned to. Um, I'll start them off on something a little bit smaller. This is one of the feeders. I really like this feeder and I think it is probably one of the best things or one of the best feeders for people who are just getting into quail that don't want to go out and spend a whole bunch of money. Um, this thing costs about 98 cents. You can pick it up at Walmart. It's called a plastic shoe box. I guess it's for storing shoes in. Uh, but all you need to do is cut some one inch or inch and a quarter holes uh, in the sides of it. You can put feed in it. Uh, the chicks can't kick the feed out, so it does a really good job. Um, and it, it makes it, you know, a suitable feeder. Now, if you have a, a whole bunch of chicks in one of your grow outs, you might need to put two of these in because uh, there's only so many holes that you can actually, you know, cut in the side. But this is the type of feeder that I use now for my younger chicks. This is uh, just a trough style feeder. It's got, you know, plenty of openings on it. <coughs> and, uh, it works really well. I don't have any problems um, from the time the chicks are about three to five days old. I'll put them on this probably closer to three days and uh, they'll be on this style feeder right up until they go into a, a grow out cage. So those work really well. Uh, and then as they, you know, get a little bit older and reach adulthood, uh, most of my birds will go on a, a trough style feeder that is mounted, you know, externally from the cage. <clears throat> this feeder here in the picture behind me is the feeders that Hatching Time sells uh, that comes with all of their cages. You can actually buy them separately on their website. Um, I use, I bought the 36 inch ones because they're, they're wide enough to fit across the entire front half of my cages. Um, but you can get by with like a one foot one, which is going to cost you a third of the price. And, uh, you know, that'll work just the same. You just might need more of them depending on the number of cages you have. <clears throat> okay, and for waters, uh, again, we're, we're talking about transitioning your chicks from what they started out with to what they're going to be using as adults. Uh, you can see in this cage, it's got both the um, uh, poultry watering cups there on the right-hand side behind me. And also I have their their chick water, which is a one quart uh, jar with the small basin. Um, I'll put that in the grow out pen with them just so uh, the birds that either aren't tall enough to use the poultry watering cups or haven't figured out how to move that uh, that little uh, plunger lever over to, you know, to get water into it. Uh, it's just, you know, a guarantee that all chicks will be able to access water. Um, this is just a shot of uh, <clears throat> some older birds uh, using it. Um, these, I think these birds are just about ready to, yeah, they're still in the grow-out pen, so they're just about ready to come out of the grow-outs and go into my 
you know, permanent breeding pens or be culled. Um, but that's just a shot of that. Uh, the nice thing about the watering cups is they can come apart. Uh, you can see it's got a little notched groove on the top of the cup to where you can twist that, uh, pull the whole assembly apart, wash the cup out. The plunger actually is just uh, mounted on a piece that's kind of pressed into the housing uh, with a plastic O-ring. So you can take all that apart, wash it up real good, and put it back in. Um, I've always had good luck with them. I've used I've used these for you know several years, even even back in my chicken days. Um, I've used these, and I also am now transitioning over to the horizontal water nipples. Uh, these are for mainly all my adult birds. Um, I do have some grow up pens that have these in them, but I always make sure that I have the quart water in there just to make sure you know that the chicks that aren't smart enough to drink out of these uh, will have water. Okay, let's talk a little bit about feed. Okay, so in the last video, uh, when we talked about uh, brooding chicks, uh, my recommendation was use a either a game bird starter or a turkey starter feed, something that is higher in protein, uh, between 28 to 30% uh, protein levels. Um, that is what I keep my chicks on from the time they hatch out right through uh, the time they start laying. Um, once they start laying, uh, I will put them on uh, a layer formula like you see there on the left. Uh, that is basically just a 16% protein. It's got a little bit higher calcium, so your, uh, you know, the egg, eggshells are uh, are strong. You don't have weak eggshells that crack or, or rubbery eggshells, stuff like that. But for the most part, uh, from your from the time they hatch out, you're going to keep them on a uh, game bird starter. If you can't find the game bird starter, uh, see if they carry a turkey starter. Chick starter, um, at least around me, most of the chick starters is a little bit lower protein. I've seen it anywhere from, you know, 20 to 24 percent. You could get by with a 24 percent chick starter, but if it were me, I would add something to it to boost the protein level up a little bit, uh, you know, like maybe soy meal or something. Uh, just just to try to get that uh, protein levels up around at least over 25 percent, preferably 28 to 30 percent. Um, especially when they're younger, the birds need that extra protein because they're growing so fast. Their metabolism is you know ungodly quick, and uh, they they just need that extra protein to build strong bones and everything. Uh, as far as vitamins and electrolytes. A lot of people I know don't use them. They say you don't need them. You know, they say if you're if you got a good feed, uh, there's no need to use this. Uh, I look at this kind of like Gatorade for my chicks, uh, especially in the warmer months. You know, during the summer down here, it gets pretty warm, so I like to give them something. You know, especially the electrolytes. This is made by a company called Dervet. Um, you can pick it up in most feed stores. Uh, also on Amazon, they carry it, but. Uh, I'll mix this up about 50% strength and give it to my chicks uh, right up through the time they start laying. And even even some of my layers get it, you know, on a really hot day, if I notice everybody panting and everything, I'll go ahead and give them a, a shot of Gatorade just to, just to make them feel good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, number of birds per cage. Uh, when you first take your birds out of the brooder, obviously they're gonna be a little bit smaller so you can fit more birds into a grow out pen. Um, I'm going to say probably four to five birds per square foot uh, when you first move them from the brooder into the grow outs. So around three weeks of age. Uh, but once they start uh, getting a little bit larger, obviously you're going to want to thin them out a little bit and get them down to around three birds per square foot. Um, they actually seem to do pretty well. Um, you know, packed in tight. I, I've never had any issues with them, you know, being in a, in a really crowded cage like this. The only problem with them being that packed is you may have to clean your manure trays on a daily basis because those little things can poop a lot and they do. Um, but this is one of my uh, larger grow out pens. I think there's probably like 40 or 50 birds in this pen, um, maybe even a little bit more at that age because they, they still look like they just come out of the brooder. Um, Okay, uh, so once your birds um, 
have been, you know, grown out and they reach, you know, six to eight weeks of age, uh, you're probably going to want to start sorting your birds, uh, sexing them. Um, as far as sexing goes, I'm not going to go into a whole lot on sexing, but uh, for the pharaohs, they're real easy. You can see that the hens have a speckled chest on a kind of an ivory colored background and the, the roosters, uh, the one directly behind me, have more of a uh, rust orange or a reddish orange uh, breast that is solid. There's no speckling. And uh, most of your uh, feather sexable varieties can be sexed using this method. Some of the different mutations might be a little bit trickier because the, the speckling on the hens has you know been lightened up a little bit. Um, but for the most part, you know, you can still differentiate the, uh, the hens from the rooster. Uh, also, uh, some of the different mutations, you might be able to just look at their heads. Uh, there's some like the uh, pansies, the rooster's going to have uh, like a solid red head. Um, and it, it just makes them, you know, easier to sex uh, when, when you've got a, you know, a feather sexable bird. Uh, <clears throat> birds that aren't feather sexable, I know this is a crappy photo, sorry about that, but um, for birds that aren't feather sexable, they'll have to be vent sexed. Um, there's two methods uh, that I know of for vent sexing. Uh, one is to actually look at the cloaca and look at the, the shape of it. A hen is going to have more of an oval shaped uh, cloaca, especially if she's already started laying eggs, to where a male is going to be more of a a slit, a sideways slit. It, it, it's real close, but when you've looked at enough of them, you'll actually be able to see the difference. Uh, but probably one of the easiest way to tell uh, on the males is at the base of the tail, um, when they're sexually mature, that will swell. Um, and if you depress that, it'll actually um, secrete a foamy substance. And uh, that's the easiest way to tell on males. The, the only problem with trying to sex them that way when they are not sexually mature or it's out of season um, is males won't produce any foam. So they, you know, the base of the tail looks the same as it would um, and, as a hen. So I would learn the cloaca method. Um, it takes a little bit of practice, but once, you, once you've seen it a few times, you'll know. Uh, another way, and it's a real simple way is to just sit back and watch your birds. Um, when the roosters start crowing, you can you know start pulling them out of the cage. Um, not all roosters are gonna crow at the same time, but if you uh, start pulling out the ones that are crowing, then the ones that weren't crowing are going to start feeling a little more sure about themselves and they will start crowing. Uh, some of them just keep quiet because there's, you know, there's more um, Alpha males, I guess you'd call it in there. Um, Tiffany, I'll get you your question here when we jump into the uh, thing. Uh, no problem. Uh, but anyhow, uh, sexing is one of the uh, uh, methods that you may want to use for sorting. Um, actually, there was another picture I was going to bring up, and I didn't. Um, I'll, I'll real quickly talk about that. Uh, as far as sorting... Um, you may be looking uh, for other things. If you're looking for breeders, you know, you're going to want to look at like confirmation, um, how well the body's built. Uh, some people weigh their birds uh, to, you know, go by size. Uh, if you're, you know, keeping breeders for color, um, then you'll want to, you know, check out patterns, uh, colors, stuff like that. Um, or if your birds are uh, just being grown up for meat, uh, you can get them up to weight, usually uh, anywhere between six and ten weeks. Uh, it's up to you, you know, what you think is a good uh, time to butcher. I usually butcher right around eight weeks. Um, but also, uh, when you have a grow up pen, you can figure roughly 50% of them are going to be roosters. I'm not saying exactly, but, you know, roughly 50% will be roosters. So you can either, you know, set them aside and use them as uh, birds that you're going to process or if you have somebody um, that you know will purchase the all your roosters from you, I have one guy that you know pretty much will take anything that I produce. Um, that's you know another way of you know getting rid of some of the birds. Uh, so 
this is the, I think this is the last photo. Yeah, this is the last photo. Uh, again, I just want to show you real quick. Uh, the cage is closest to me. Right behind me is one of my brooder setups. The next two, um, the middle two are layer cages, and the far one on the other end is also a uh, a brooder setup. Um, 